I'm Eric Miskell with EMS Now, and welcome to this edition of EMS Now Up Close. This is when we invite uh, interesting people to join us for a conversation and learn a little bit more about the industry. Uh, my guest today is Everett Frank with Digisource. Um, Everett is a longtime industry veteran. We'll let him introduce himself here in just a moment. Uh, but ever, if, if memory serves correct, the last time I saw you live was in a piano bar in San Diego and you were singing Lady Gaga. Is that correct? I'm... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you were singing Lady Gaga. I was backing you. There it was. There it was. It was yeah. We uh, brought the house down, I'm sure. So Good. listen, Everett, thank you for taking time today. I know what I wanted to talk to you about is the whole theme of restoring U.S. manufacturing competitiveness. But before we launch into some questions on that, let, let me just allow you to introduce yourself, who you are for the benefit of our audience. All right, uh, so uh, I started uh, a long, long time ago uh, in, uh, in distribution, Hamilton Avnet, uh, back when it, was, when it was called that. And I was uh, in distribution for about 10 years. Um, I was in field sales and operations management and general management and corporate management. And eventually we were acquired by uh, Aero in the mid nineties and I made the jump into contract manufacturing. Uh, and I've worked for contract manufacturers, large and small. Um, I've run cable operations, uh, sheet metal operations, machining operations, s &P operations, precision assembly operations. Um, I've done mergers and acquisitions on both sides. And I've consulted to uh, subcontracting companies in all those fields and to OEMs. And, and so in, in brief, that's, that's the background. That's who you are. Wealth of information packaged in there. Um, so your latest venture is called Digisource. Why don't you tell us what, what you do exactly? Yeah, uh, so Digisource is, uh, uh, is focused, if that's the right way to put it, on uh, sourcing support for both OEMs and, and EMS companies. So um, um, we do a couple of things. So we, we help, we help uh, pair uh, OEMs and EMS companies. And so we help, we help the OEM sourcing from that standpoint. And then we, we help both sides with regard to component sourcing. And, um, and this leads then into the kind of the competitiveness discussion um, components are actually, typically everybody knows about 80% of the bomb cost. So if you wanna talk about uh, being competitive in the United States, the first thing is to be able to source material um, competitively with globally available prices. So, so, so DigiKey, does, or I'm sorry, DigiSource does, um, does, does both those things. It introduces people to the right partners and then helps that partnership find the right component source. Mm -hmm. And you call your service intelligent introductions, right? I like that. So you, and you have a, how does that work then for customers? Yeah, we do think that that's, that that's a different thing. So we're not, we're not, uh, we're not a directory. We're not a resource of, of, of EMS companies, right? We, um, we actually look um, in, uh, in a certain level of depth at the OEM's needs. Um, so um, those, those probably um, most, um, importantly, fall into a costing evaluation. So uh, we look at the at the project, uh, either the group of projects or the individual projects that the OEM has, and we develop our own opinion about what that price should be. So we apply actually a range of models, and much like uh, weather forecasting, when the, the the way weather forecasting is done is weather forecasting, uh, where the forecasters take a bunch of models, and as those models converge they say that's the forecast. So uh, similarly, we apply a range of models and as those models converge, we say that's the price that the OEM ought to be paying. And then, and then we independently can go out to the EMS community and say, can you support this kind of pricing for this kind of OEM? So by the time we make the introduction, uh, both parties are extraordinarily uh, well qualified in terms of uh, uh, wanting to meet each other. Mm -hmm. So, and on those models, I mean, I'm sure there, there's some general industry ones or probably proprietary ones as well. So, um, and having done some of that in my past, how, how have those changed over the years now? Are you using and applying and looking at the same way or is, is the new reality now, has it required a change on your part? Well, um, 
I, that's a very good question. The, um, I, I think that for most people, the reality hasn't changed a lot. The models themselves, particularly in the United States, the modeling hasn't changed. Maybe some of the inputs have changed. Um, labor costs, for instance, have evolved at least subtly. Um, so from a traditional model, the traditional cost plus model, return on sales model, mm -hmm. that, that model certainly still uh, dominates. And it's particularly in the United States for high mix low volume manufacturers, that's the predominant model. Um, a model that we think um, companies who want to compete on an international scale need to evolve to is more of a return on investment model, which is actually how large programs are priced at, at tier one EMS companies. Okay, good. Well, here, let's get into our topic du jour here, this, the, the idea of restoring US manufacturing competitiveness. And a term that's, that's used a lot in this way is reshoring. And, uh, you know, which implies bringing manufacturing back. Um, so is reshoring possible here in the United States? Yeah, yeah, reshoring is, uh, is, is very much possible. Um, there's a couple of um, predicates, a couple of things that have made it, um, you know, uh, 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 th th there are certain products that are, that are best suited to it. So it's those products that, that are involve automation where effectively you're reducing the amount of direct labor into the product, right? So mm -hmm. the one that's most um, obvious right now is s and manufacturing. Anything that's really, um, you know, 100%, 90 plus percent S&P manufacturing can be produced in the United States for prices that are competitive with offshore. And that's really before considering TCO. If you add in uh, the total cost of offshoring, total cost of ownership, you're, you're talking, you, you could be eight or 9% cost reduction uh, by sourcing in the United States, depending upon the product, of course. Mm -hmm. So then, so it's possible, is it happening? It's it's happening more than it was happening before. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I think interestingly, COVID kind of put a pause to it in, in the sense that um, during certainly that first let's say nine months or so of, of of COVID, nobody was doing anything, right? You couldn't travel, you couldn't audit, you couldn't change suppliers, right? So there was really very little migration between companies, and then as we sort of started to accept the new reality and we started to accept, accept Zoom as a way of communicating, you're now seeing companies conducting audits over Zoom. It's really, it's becoming, uh, I don't know if common is quite the right word, but it's a very accepted practice now that you can actually audit a manufacturing facility uh, via Zoom calls, right? So, mm -hmm. so the, it's opening back up now that, uh, that OEMs can consider uh, uh, alternates to their current supply chain and that's then uh, opening the conversation to reshoring. And then obviously the, the, the political situation, the tariffs um, has motivated um, at least a portion. In, in my view, it's still a very small portion of, of, um, of OEMs that are actively reshoring, but it's certainly more active than it was. Okay. So then let me take it from both sides of the track, so to speak here. How would you recommend an EMS company embrace reshoring? Yeah, the, the, the EMS companies, um, by far the number one thing for the um, mid-sized EMS companies, let's say, companies, certainly companies who only have U.S. operations, the number one thing is to understand component sourcing. Most of them are primarily sourcing through um, U.S. authorized distribution and maybe a little bit direct, but they tend to think that if they've gone to uh, Aero and Avnet, that they're getting the best price in the world. Or the, and uh, and too often, this simply isn't the case. And, and, and uh, the semiconductor companies are offering better prices in other markets, particularly the APAC region, than they are in the United States. There's a, um, there's, there, and I wanna, I wanna add here, Eric, there are two schools of thought on what I'm saying here. So there are people who disagree with me, um, but I can tell you um, unquestionably, I've seen circumstances over and over where the pricing for a certain quantity, certain type of OEM that's available in the APAC region is quite different than the pricing that's available in the United States. Um, again, there's people who disagree with me on that, but I've seen it over and over again. And if you don't know how to access those global prices, you're, it doesn't matter what your labor is, your labor rate or what you're paying in the United States for your labor. You're, you're, you're at such a disadvantage on 80% of the bomb cost. So the first thing for EMS companies is to understand how to access uh, global pricing. Um, 
And I think the next thing is, is to get a, a, a um, more culturally ingrained understanding of, uh, of, uh, of automation and, and the importance and the cost of automation, particularly in their SMT lines. Um, so, the, you know, the first thing we talk about in an SMT line is component placements per hour or the placement rate. And we tend to use that as the metaphor for its, um, its rate. CPH itself is a nuanced calculation and, um, and, and it's, it gets quite complicated. Um, just, mm -hmm. just, just figuring out CPH, you should really be looking at total throughput. CPH is really an input to total throughput. You should really be looking at, at, at a metric like that. And, and, and understanding it, understanding the cost associated with producing at that rate. And then second is efficiency. How, how much of the shift is that line operating? So those two things have an enormous impact. It's just the, the, the estimates um, over and over you hear on efficiency are 30 to 40%. So on average, um, uh, an, an EMS operation is actually producing revenue 30 to 40 percent of the time, right? So if you think about what that means, if you can up that efficiency to 60 to 70 percent, you've effectively cut your pricing in half. It, it's 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 a tremendous effect. Yeah. Um, and there's not too many uh, uh, EMS companies, in my experience, that if you call them up right now and pointed at that line, that they could tell you what the CPH and efficiency of that line is. And, and so I think really, really embracing. Your, your total throughput as a, as a method of understanding your costs, I think are the two things, materials and throughput. Okay, interesting. Well, what about the other side, the OEM side of that? How should, uh, how should an OEM approach the, the issue of reshoring? Yeah, yeah. Well, we are also big advocates of, uh, of, of should cost as, as a sourcing methodology uh, versus strategic sourcing, which is the classic method. So strategic sourcing, is a nice way of saying we went out, we got a bunch of quotes, and we and we and we bought the cheapest quote. And so that's the the classic method of procurement is uh, sort of uh, can be called strategic sourcing, right? And and it stands in contrast to should cost sourcing, which in should cost sourcing you're going out and saying this is what my product should cost, and you're going out and seeking a supplier who can do that. So so we yeah. advocate that. Um, we put a, uh, a cost model on our on our website, uh, the Digicore, uh, the Digisource.com. There's an SMP pricing model there that will um, give the OEMs an expected price based on their inputs, both in the United States and China and Mexico, and and we would say use that as the basis. So figure that out as you should cost, and then go seek a contract manufacturer who will support that pricing. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, and do, do OEMs? I mean, I'd, I'd imagine that the the reshoring initiative really hits is more profound on the EMS side because they're the ones with the factories. They're the ones, you know, maybe being asked to shift right manufacturing from another region here because of political pressures or whatever that might be. So, uh, so would the do the OEMs? Is it really that big of a care about for them? It, uh, 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 not in my experience, um, and uh, and I think that that's sort of a whole other fascinating project or, uh, or question. But if you think about people who are in supply chain at, at, at the OEMs, right, uh, solving geopolitical problems is not what they're paid to do. They're 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 paid to to number one uh, have a secure supply of quality product. That's yeah. the, that's the number one thing, and the second is to do it at a good price, right? Yeah. So they're not. They're not here to solve the big, the big issues, right? Or, or mm -hmm. why are there inequities, uh, you know, between countries, et cetera, right? They're here to do the best job they can uh, for bringing in product for their companies, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm good at it. <laughs> so yeah, and they're good at it. You know, I, 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 I I've had we, we we've been um, you know selling this idea of, of onshoring for years now, and I can tell you that if you go to an OEM that's currently sourcing offshore and they're happy. They're happy with their supply mm -hmm. chain. And you say, here's a 20% cost reduction to move back to the United States. They won't do it over and over again. 20% mm -hmm. um, is not enough to, to disrupt their supply chain, right? It's too much change, too much, et cetera, right? Um, I, th I think to get them to disrupt, you'd have to be 30, 40% or above. 
if they're already moving, if they're already looking at changes for some other reason, now they're open to sourcing in the United States. That's a good distinction. Thank you. You wear another hat in life too, and you have for a while, and that is your role on the IPC Government Relations Committee. So with the whole discussion of reshoring, will, will the government be stepping in to support it? Yeah, I think you're, you're going to see uh, um, a lot going on um, right now. And the, the government is actually uh, reaching out. The executive branch is, is reaching out on this subject um, to IPC right now. And it's, 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 it's a lot. It's certainly there's a new administration and they're seeking direction and that's sort of common. But they're also talking about spending $4 trillion dollars. On, on infrastructure, whatever, whatever that means. Yeah. But they're, they're going to spend $4 trillion and they're reaching out and asking, how should we spend that money? And mm -hmm. um, in the context of electronics, they're asking, how do we, how do we um, restore American competitiveness? And this is sort of put in other things. You see um, security of supply, um, you know, other buzzwords around it. Um, there's a, a trusted suppliers. There's various initiatives around that. Um, you know, we can't trust Huawei and all, the, all these other concerns, right. but um, they're looking at spending uh, a lot of money. In, uh, in, in December of last year, in the Defense Authorization Act, they authorized billions of dollars for chip fabrication, up to $3 billion per company to build new fabs in the United States, um, mm -hmm. as an example, right? So there's a lot going to be done. Um, and we probably have like a four or five week window as an industry to really um, step forward and by as an industry, I'm speaking specifically about the EMS and the PCB sector of the industry, right? We have this window to step forward and say, here's, here's what would help us become more competitive. And uh, so I think it's, a, it's an exciting four or five weeks coming up. Yeah. And so what would the recommendation or the ask be on that for people in the industry, people watching who are hearing this and wish to kind of have their voice heard? Is that to, to engage with the IPC then since they're in the industry and share their thoughts or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can reach out to the um, IPC Government Relations Committee. Um, you can certainly um, reach out to me and I'll pass that through. Um, and I think there'll be other forums. I think IPC will be doing some outreach on this as well um, mm -hmm. to have, have their voice heard. Um, and I think, a, I think a really important voice to me too in this is, is the investor community um, or, or the um, companies who are um, currently engaged in the industry and ask, what would it take for you to invest in the United States? What would it take for you to create these factories in the United States, right? What, what, what would cause you to step up? And I think on the OEM side, I think the question is, what would motivate you to come back to the United States? What would motivate you to consider the United States? And those are really the core questions. And if we can answer those, um, there's, I think there's a lot of government support uh, in the wings. Okay, excellent. Well, that's definitely a topic I'd like to follow up on with you and, and as we move forward here, because I think, as you said, this is the time is now for this. And if, if there's that window of opening, we need to for those of you listening who wish to kind of be involved and share your voices, please do uh, please do so, either to the IPC or to Mr. Frank here, who is very active on LinkedIn and very easy to find. So uh, <laughs> please reach out to him um, or the IPC directly. Um, Everett, it's time to end this this conversation, but uh, hopefully we can pick it up and continue on some of this as we move forward. So, you know, I thank you. I wish you success in your new venture. I'm excited for you. Uh, you've always been a respected colleague and um, thanks for sharing your time and your thoughts with our audience today. Yeah, thanks very much, Eric. I very much appreciate it. And, uh, and I always look forward to chatting with you and look forward to doing it again. Very good. Thank you, sir.